Nowhere will you find a representation of the diversity of the Chicagoland business community than right here in this room and with the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce. We just met Wendy, an emerging entrepreneur and philanthropist in the retail and e-commerce space. And now we're going to move on to our keynote speaker, who is a critically acclaimed chef who turned recipes for handcrafted food into a global brand that's played an outside role in making Chicago a foodie destination to people around the world. This past April, Chef Rick Bayless's restaurant, Topolobampo, earned the top award of the 2017 James Beard Award. It was named this year's Outstanding Restaurant. The award is the most recent of eight Beard Awards Chef Bayless has won in his career, including back in 2007 when Frontera Grill also won for Outstanding Restaurant. Rick has expanded his footprint well beyond Chicago. He has nine cookbooks, a TV series, a line of salsas, sauces, and organic chips. And coming soon, grocery store Frozen Isles will stock Frontera branded bowls and skillet meals. But that's not all. Philanthropy is also in Chef Bayless's DNA, just like it is in Wendy's. Rick and his staff established the Frontera Farmer Foundation to support small Midwestern farms. They launched a full tuition scholarship that sends Mexican-American Chicago public school students to Kendall College to study the culinary arts. Rick, thank you for all you do for Chicago. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my high honor to present to you our featured speaker today, the one and only Chef Rick Bayless. It's an honor to be able to speak with you today. Um, we're going to have some time for questions, I know, uh, because it's, for me, it's really important to know what you're interested in. Um, with reference to how we've built what we've built here in Chicago over the last 30 years. We just uh, passed a, an amazing milestone for a restaurant. We did just complete 30 years in Chicago on Clark Street. We had a, uh, a big celebration at the Art Institute. Uh, it was wonderful to be able to pull together people that we have been working with in this community over the last 30 years and to celebrate something that was the development of what we have done but what all of our partners in the business have done as well. The first, um, the first person that called on me uh, back in 1987 was the uh, rep from Edward Don that does uh, tabletop stuff and small wares for the kitchens. And um, she was at that party and is still our rep after 30 years. And it was really wonderful to, to be able to track what has happened in both of our lives over this last 30 years. And that's kind of what I'm here to talk about today. Um, and that is sort of growth with integrity. When we started our restaurant, um, I see, I grew up in a restaurant family. And um, the one thing that I knew was not right for me was to inherit my parents' restaurant. It was, I, I grew up in a barbecue restaurant in Oklahoma City, but um, at an early age, my early teens, I fell in love with um, other cultures and studying culture. Um, but I specifically fell in love with Mexico and its culture and decided that that's what I wanted to put my focus on. At one point in my life, I figured, well, I'll go to college, I'll study Spanish and, and Latin American culture, and I'll become a Spanish teacher, a Spanish professor someplace. Um, but then I, my, my love for language grew very deep, and I decided to go to graduate school to really focus my life in the, in the relationship between language and culture. And when I was at University of Michigan uh, studying that, I rekindled because I was now disconnected from my family's restaurant where I had worked since I was a little kid. I rekindled my love for food. And I woke up one morning and I thought to myself as I was writing my dissertation for a PhD in anthropological linguistics, yes, that does exist, um, that I, 
that what I really loved was the relationship between food and culture, even more than the relationship between language and culture. So I took a turn and went back into food for a while, thinking that I would probably become a food writer. Um, I decided that my focus was going to be on Mexico, and my wife and I moved there, and over a period of five years, um, we had the opportunity to travel to every state in the Mexican Republic and to le learn from local cooks with the idea that at the end of a year we were going to be able to write a cookbook, but as I have already spilled the beans, it took five years to do that big project um, because the, the, the cuisine was super complex. So when we decided, when we turned our manuscript in for our first book, which came out in 1987, the same year that we opened Frontera, um, I had to decide what, was, what I was going to do with my life. And I had spent all of this time writing these recipes down, but um, I had this gnawing feeling that when people made this food from the recipes that I had written, no matter how clearly I had written them, that they weren't necessarily going to turn out good. And then they were going to think poorly of me. So I thought that the best thing that I could do is to go back, resurrect my roots in the restaurant business, and open a, a restaurant that featured the real food of Mexico, the regional uh, specialties from the different parts of Mexico. And that's what we did with Frontera. But I will say that m what set us apart from the very beginning was that I was very clear to think about who I am. So I love to cook, but I knew if I was just a restaurant cook, that I wouldn't be able to express all parts of myself. I am also a researcher and writer, so I had to build into my schedule the opportunity to satisfy that part of me. I'm also a communicator. And by that point in my life, I had not only written a whole lot of things, but I had taught probably a thousand cooking classes and loved teaching. And I had already done one series of television shows, 26-part series for public television back in the late 70s, early 80s. And I knew that that was a part of me as well. So I started building for myself a, an opportunity to satisfy all parts of what, uh, who I know that I am. And then um, my wife and I asked ourselves before we even opened Frontera, what do we want this restaurant to do? And with that question, we were able to get to our guiding principles, basically. Um, and, and I know a lot of people would say, oh, I want my restaurant to be um, thought of as the best restaurant in Chicago or the most financially successful restaurant in Chicago. But we had, an, we had a different focus from the very beginning. First and foremost, we wanted our restaurant to be influential. And so we made specific choices that would lead us to be able to be influential. And when I say that, I am thinking first and foremost of influential in bringing the traditional foods of Mexico into the everyday vocabulary of folks here in Chicago and perhaps beyond that. We wanted to use our restaurant as a way of building community. So from the very first day, we developed a staff that was very much like a family staff. And I know all of you work in different businesses and can relate to that because you spend so much time with the people that you work with that you begin to think of them as close like family. But because we work a lot with an immigrant community in restaurants, as everyone does, uh, we wanted to make sure that when their community groups had special things that we could contribute as best we could to all of those things to make that family a little circle a little bit wider. During the beginning years of Frontero, <clears throat> we had the opportunity to see growth in a lot of chef-related community um, organizations. And we were able to contribute uh, a lot to that. 
And from, so from the very beginning, we thought of our restaurant as having the opportunity or needing to take the opportunity to really focus on community development. And then we thought of our restaurant as a long-term project. And that really helped us to make certain decisions as well. We didn't jump on everything that was presented to us for growth potential, but we only took advantage of the things that we thought, number one, our staff was ready to develop. So we thought of it as, we made the decision as a whole family, what's the, the family want to do for the next step of growth? And what are we ready to do for the next step of growth? Um, but we also thought about how, it's, how it relates to our being influential and our being part of the community. I think of um, the restaurant business because I grew up in a long-term restaurant. My parents' restaurant was open for 37 years. We've just passed 30, so I'm on the, the final home stretch um, to uh, reaching my goal, which is to be a 38-year-old restaurant. Um, the <clears throat> We thought of the restaurant, our work in our restaurant, as being much more like a, like a mar training for a marathon, not training for a sprint. I came across um, a, a saying last year. Um, it's attributed as an African saying, but I'm not sure um, where it comes from. But the saying is that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go in a group. And that's sort of become a mantra uh, for our restaurant because we are in this for the long haul. And we know that, and you can all relate to this, I'm sure, that sometimes if you want to get a particular job done, don't get the group involved because it'll take too long. If you have to get it done quickly, then maybe you just need to be as smart as you possibly can be and do it all yourself. But our restaurant in general is that long-term, uh, uh, it has that long-term goal of being successful over a long period of time so that we can be as influential as we can. We can build a place that all the folks that work with us um, have the opportunity to make a good living and that at the end of the day, we are part and parcel of the Chicago community. We think of ourselves as part of the community. And we know that the only way that we can do that, that's a very far long-term goal, is to do it well as a group. <clears throat> From the very first uh, days of our restaurant, we didn't take, we didn't set goals for ourselves that were unrealistic and long-term. We used this mantra of what's the next right step? What's the next right step for today? What's the next right step that will take us into the future? And as we asked ourselves that question, what's the next right step? It made us step back and look at the bigger picture. And I've already sort of given you our, our goals for our restaurant, which were not only to be financially successful, and it's when you're, when you're in a restaurant that's as mission-driven as ours, wanting to be part of the community, develop the community, and be a real influencer, um, it's easy for people to say, oh, but um, you know, we should just push the financials to the side. But obviously, you can't stay in business over a long period and really thrive over a long period if you're not taking very careful care of the financials. I happen to be married to a person who is really focused on that. And because I'm much more of the dreamer, and she is much more of the pragmatist, realist, um, we make a really good team in that. And with my chefs, even though many of my chefs are big dreamers as well and super creative, I make us all sit down every week and go over every bit of our financials. Because as I tell them, without that financial foundation, we obviously can't 
do the things that we love to do. We can't be creative, we can't be the influencers, we can't develop community in the way that we want to. So we do this little project, which we call vision writing. And um, I, it's not something I came up with, it's something that I um, uh, have taken from a lot of work back and forth with the Zingerman's group in Ann Arbor, where I went to graduate school. And they teach this vision writing, which is very different than setting goals. Um, and I find it super useful, so I'll share it with you folks today. It's where you sit down with a piece of blank paper and you put a date on it that's in the future. And you write from the perspective of that date. And you say where you are, it, uh, what you have achieved, what your business looks like at that point in the future. And the reason that that is not the same as goals is because you have to attach the way you feel to it. So we start, we, we do this once a year with the full group of management staff, which is 35 people. Everybody writes something that starts with th this last one they wrote. It's December 31st, 2017, and I feel whatever. You can feel exhausted. You can feel elated. You can feel frustrated. But it makes you bring something to this thing. And then you just track over the year what has happened to you. Now, of course, it's all conjecture, and things may be different. But in giving that that vision, a sort of fine, uh, 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 concrete description, you have to then stop and do the second part of it, which is to break it into chunks and say, if this is where I want to be, if this is where I envision myself being at the end of the year, how did I get there? And what were the realistic steps that I took to get there? And in breaking that down, oftentimes you will see where there's struggles and where you're going to have problems. <clears throat> of course, life throws all kinds of wrenches into you, so uh, uh, toward you, and so you have to be willing to play with that as you're going along. We just went through a couple of um, management changes um, in staff, and so I sat down last re week and rewrote my vision completely. And in fact, it, I, I didn't even put the date on it of December 31st. I put the date on it of, of September 31st because I needed to get a really clear vision of where our organization needs to go over the next few weeks, few months not all the way to the end of the year. And then I'll sit down and write it again in September and see how, the end, how, how I envision the end of the year coming out. And we have found this to be really useful in getting our staff to, to share what's in their heart. And that's what you do when you write a vision. For me, it's a, an essential tool that we have found um, really helps to propel us into a positive future. Also, when we're writing our visions, we have the opportunity to reflect on how they relate to the overall mission of our restaurant. Now, they, somebody asked me last night, what has made you successful over so many years? And I quickly came up with an answer for that. I was standing in our restaurant on Saturday night, and you know we opened 30 years ago, Frontera opened 30 years ago, and we had, within six weeks or so, um, it became a hot restaurant in Chicago. And people started lining up at five, or before five o'clock, so that they could get into the first seating of the restaurant. We didn't take reservations at all when we first opened Frontera, so there was this, this development of an enthusiasm on the part of Chicago diners to get in that first seating of the restaurant so that you didn't have to go on the waiting list and wait for a couple of hours for your table to be ready. 
So we got this line, and Frontera became sort of known for, oh, yeah, yeah, you've got this long line. And if you really want to make sure you eat, you get there at 4.30. So when they open the door at 5 o'clock, you can get in that first thing. 4.30 in the afternoon, you tell that to New Yorkers, and they think you're absent. So that's like lunchtime for them, OK? So um, it, it happened. And on Saturday night, as we were getting ready for um, service, we had our meeting with all of our staff right before service, as we do every day. And I turned around and I looked, and there was a line that went clear down the block. I'm not even sure there was enough spaces in the restaurant to seat all of those people. And I thought, OK, this is 30 years later, and we still have that line. And I was reflecting on, what is it that we have done that has made people want to get in that line at 4.30 in the afternoon. And what I thought of, and what I answered to the fellow that asked me that last night, was that we have, the, we have really focused on the daily stuff and love the daily stuff. So for me, I love going to work and doing exactly the same thing that I have done every single day for 30 years. I love it. I love going on the line and tasting every one of the preparations that the cooks have made. I love walking through the dining room and making sure that everything is just right, all the light bulbs, nothing is burnt out, that every table is set right. I love walking to the front door and seeing the restaurant just the way that my guests will see it every single day. But I also love dreaming. I love seeing, making that vision for the future of where we can be and how, how we can even improve everything that we are doing. And certainly you will find that all of my sous chefs um, will tell you that you either love me or you hate me because every day I will eat one of your dishes and I will say, now can't we just make this a little bit better? What if we just did this to that dish? Because to me, well, I will say that the restaurant business, our world, is never finished. It's always a thing of growth. And because we are in a daily business, we have to make the food, you have to come in, order the food, and eat the food, and then we have to start that whole process over again the next day. It's always about being involved in the everyday, churning out of the, of the food, of the hospitality. And as we always say in our restaurant, whatever the last food is that goes out of the kitchen at night or at lunch, that is our best. That's what represents our best. And that keeps everybody focused to do that for the very, to the very end. We, we have, I have a lot more things that I could share with you, but I think at this point um, it would be better to go to questions. So someone told me that questions are going to come our way here, and I will be able to now Taylor, make my comments to what it is that you folks are really interested in this morning. Hello? There it goes. Oh, All right. there we are. Okay. Hello, Chef. Hi. How are you today? Okay. I couldn't be better. That was great. So we, we, hi, everybody. Let's have a big round of applause for Chef Michaelis. So basically, the equation is daily preparation and interaction with a grand vision to accomplish your mission. Yes. <laughs> I'll get to better questions so we get good answers. That was, that was wonderful of you to summarize the whole thing in that one <laughs> sentence. But yes, that is what it's all about. But I think those are great lessons for all of us. And you talked about your evolution to where you got today. So thinking about how you run your business today, tell us a little bit about, in a different way, 30 plus years ago, you could have opened your business anywhere. In fact, you're not a native Chicagoan. No. So tell us what you saw in Chicago long before we were known as a foodie town right. that made you do what you did here. Okay, there were a couple of reasons that we decided to open in Chicago. Uh, one of them was that we were living part-time in Los Angeles, and we, had, we were actually working for a, chain of, a small chain of Mexican restaurants there, and we 
the, the owners of that wanted us to start our restaurant in Chicago, I mean, in Los Angeles, and they were willing to back us financially 100%. Now, we had to turn away from that only because we didn't think that the atmosphere in Los Angeles, which was a big foodie mecca at the time, was the kind of thing that would, <clears throat> pardon me, would bear us along for 30 or more years. We saw that a lot of the really hot restaurants in Los Angeles would have a run of about five years, and then they would have to close down, and usually then the chef, if it was the chef owner, have to come up with a new concept and start all over. I didn't want to do that. And when my wife is from Chicago, I grew up in Oklahoma City, as I had told you before, but um, I had never had the opportunity to live in Chicago, though I had visited here a lot, and I loved something about the, the way that the Chicago community would support you over a long period of time if you did something that was really solid quality and was solid value. And that's what I wanted to do. That's what I, how I would describe my family's restaurant growing up. And I thought Chicago would have that, that in spades for us. I also discovered, as I settled and really put my roots down in Chicago, that I loved that the character of the Midwest. People here are just open, and there's not a, there's not a lot of frou-frou stuff here. People are, they're honest, they're open, they're genuine, and there wasn't a lot of pretense, and I felt really comfortable with that. Clearly, I was going to bring to Chicago a type of cuisine that was not fancy highfalutin, and I was not trying to do it in such a modern way. I wanted to do it modern enough that it seemed like it was just what you wanted to eat, but not so modern that it looked like I was doing crazy things to it just to make myself stand out. I wanted to do it with great integrity and to say, you know what, folks, this is what our next door neighbor's eating, and I think you're gonna love it. Longevity and value. That sounds like you're describing the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce. I think so. 113 years we're here, you, you guys. You didn't say that to me to say. <laughs> so, I mean, you didn't tell me that and I had a time. That's just what came out of my mouth. Thank you, that was terrific. But I, I do think, I would agree with you, I think most of us here would agree with you that Chicago is a city where, where we invest in you and you invest in us. Absolutely. And we're all in this for the long haul. Yes. So I appreciate those comments. So here's a, a, a light one. <clears throat> what do you love to eat that you don't cook yourself? Oh. Um, pretty much everything. Um, I'm a total omnivore, and because I work nights, it's hard for me to get to other people's restaurants. We started our restaurant, uh, this was part of our, our community values, we started our restaurant in a location that we thought we could be solidly busy for lunch and dinner because my wife and I wanted to close our restaurant for two days a week two consecutive days, Sunday and Monday, and we have always been closed on Sunday and Monday. And that gave us a, a work-life balance that was really a positive one because um, restaurant business, I, I'm a very active person. I don't mind working long days. In fact, if I didn't have that to do, which is what I discovered when I was trying to go in an academic direction when I was younger, that um, I'm way too active a person to sit in a library, a quiet library. I need activity around me all day long and I need to be moving. And so I don't mind those long days. We, my wife and I say we work from uh, Tuesday morning to Saturday night, and then we have two days off. Um, and that's kind of the way it is, but we don't mind that. We're both very active people, and we love the, the work that we do. Um, but for us, we wanted, to be, we wanted to be a restaurant that from the very beginning would have this, uh, would offer our, all of those that work with us a, a nice work-life balance. Work-life balance, everybody. Are we all jealous this morning? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, we're going to ask you to do a little bit of, of looking into the future. And yes. can you tell us what food trends you see coming down the pike? Hmm. 
It's a very interesting time to be in the, the food business because everything goes. I know that when you read some of the magazines, you will probably read that, um, you know, something, the, the casualization, the small plates, the sharing and all that. Yeah, it's all, it's really very hot right now. So is fine dining. Chicago has, has seen more fine dining uh, restaurants open in the last two years than we have in years. And they're full and they're exciting. And the people that are behind them are bringing great innovation. So I think there's just a little bit of everything. The wonderful thing, when we first opened our restaurant, there were three chef-owned restaurants in Chicago. Three, okay? And we thought, man, this is going to be hard because we want to do a real chef-owned restaurant, but people don't even relate to that. They don't even know what that is hardly in Chicago. Um, now it's like almost every restaurant that you read about in any of the magazines on any of the social media, um, they're all chef-owned restaurants, and that is really exciting. And the restaurant groups that we're talking about, you know, when, when we first opened, it was just let us entertain you in the Levy's. And now it's a whole lot of chef-owned restaurant groups, which is very exciting because there are so many chefs that have so much to offer that they have now developed um, more, more opportunities for the people that want to grow with them. So that's a very exciting thing that we're seeing right now. But because there are these chef-owned restaurant groups and just chef-owned restaurants, you're finding a lot of, sh of the um, the casualization going all the way to quick service. So like when we opened Shoko, our quick service place, we didn't do it the way perhaps um, an entrepreneurial restaurateur would do it. We did it the way an entrepreneurial chef would do it, bringing the same integrity to all of the preparations that we do that you would find in any of the other restaurants that are right there adjacent to it on Clark Street. So we use all the same products. You know, we approach the things, the preparation of the dishes the way we would in our fine dining restaurant, Topolo Bampo. Um, and I think you're seeing a lot more of that. And then, of course, we were able, and you will all thank me for this, to bring it to O'Hare because that gave us the opportunity. <laughs> What we had experienced at Shoko and developing all of that, we were able then to downsize and transfer to O'Hare so that we could give you not only delicious food, but food with great integrity the same way that we prepare it on Clark Street. So in terms of trends, it's everything. It's all kinds of diverse flavors at all different levels. We, were, we live in a really, really exciting time as far as food is concerned. I would agree, thank you. So let's close with a little inspiration drawing from your, your desire to be an influencer. Earlier this year, there was a day without immigrants <clears throat> and you led a, a significant um, effort with this, not only in Chicago, but I think it took on nationwide. Can you tell us a little bit about why you, tell us what you did, and a little bit about why you did okay. it. Okay. Um, we work with a largely immigrant population, and right now, obviously, this is a, a topic that is very timely, that we are thinking about a lot, and um, I, it was an interesting way that this all came about. Um, I'm not a person that typically likes to put things up for a vote. Um, I instead like to develop consensus amongst our staff. And so that's not necessarily a, a vote kind of thing. Um, we, however, chose to do this as a vote. We had a bunch of staff come to us and say, just we would like to express our support for this movement by not being at work on that day. So then the first thing that you do is try to figure out how many people that is and can we cover it and still be open for business. And what we discovered was that the, the scale was tipping in the direction of, I don't know if we could even be open to cover things. So we took some time to talk about all of the, uh, of the options for us. And so we, offered to our staff that there was two ways that they could support this. One is by going to the rally not being at work, and the other was to be at work 
and then we would give 10% of our gross that day to one of the local um, immigrant support uh, groups here in town, which is necessary as well. And we talked to everybody about what that was, and then we let each restaurant vote. So we had the Clark Street restaurants all voted to close, Wicker Park decided to close, and then Lenya Brava decided to stay open. And we were able to then, everyone was able to feel like they were contributing something to a cause that was very near and dear to their hearts and do it in a way that seemed appropriate for them. Because obviously, if you say, I'm not going to come to work that day, that you're, you're doing something financially <laughs> for yourself and for the restaurant. And so they all had to make the decision. And it was a very interesting thing that happened, because we're about 50% um, immigrants that work with us. And the, that it was a, a, on Clark Street, the three restaurants together, they all voted together. And it was a 100%, there were no detractors from it. 100% of the people that worked there said they wanted to support this movement. So we decided to close, not understanding that we might be becoming the poster child for this thing when that happened. It was just, again, we were only looking to our family and what was right for them at that moment. It was another example, I think, of us saying, what's the next right step for us as a restaurant? And that proved to be the next right step for us. And we did it only internally, not thinking about anything um, on the outside. Thank you. That's very inspirational. A big, big round of applause for Chef Rick Bayless. Thank you. Vision, integrity. This guy's got it all, and he's right here in Chicago. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Absolutely.